Hatchet by Gary Paulson, Chapter 16. And now he stood at the end of the long part of the lake and was not the same, but would not be the same again. There had been many first days. First arrow day, when he had used the thread from a tattered old piece of the windbreaker and some pitch from a stump to put slivers of feather on a dry willow shaft and make an arrow that would fly correctly. correctly. Not accurately. He never really got good with it, but fly correctly. So that if a rabbit or a fool bird sat in one place long enough, close enough, and he had enough arrows, he could hit it. That first rabbit, that brought first rabbit day, when he killed one of the large rabbits with an arrow and skinned it, and he had the first, he, as he had the first bird, cooked it the same to find the meat as good, not as rich as the bird, but still good. There were strips of fat on the back of the rabbit that cooked into the meat to make it richer. Now, when he went back and forth between rabbits and full birds, when he could, filling in with fish in the middle, always hungry. I'm always hungry, but I can do it now. I can get food, and I know, know I can get food, and it makes me more, and I know what I can do. He moved closer to the lake to a stand of nut brush. These were thick bushes with little stickler pods that held green nuts, nuts that he thought he might be able to eat but they weren't ripe yet. He was out for fool bird, and they liked to hide in the base of the thick part of the nut brush, back, back in where the stems were close together and provided cover. In the second clump, he saw a bird, moved close to it, paused when the head feathers came up and made it sound like a cricket, a sign of alarm just before it flew, and then moved closer. When the feathers went down, the bird relaxed. He did this four times, never looking at the bird directly, moving toward it at an angle so that it seemed he was moving off to the side. He had perfected this method after many attempts and worked it so well that he had actually caught one with his bare hands until he was standing less than three feet from the bird, which was frozen in a hiding, altitude, uh, hiding attitude in the bush. The bird held, him for, held for him, and he put an arrow into the bow, one of the feathered arrows, not a fish arrow, drew it and released. It was a clean miss, and he took another arrow out of the cloth pouch at his belt, which he'd made from a piece of windbreaker sleeve, tied it to one end to make a bottom, and the fool bird sat still for him, and he did not look directly at it until he drew the second arrow and aimed and released and missed again. This time the bird jerked a bit, and the arrow stuck next to it, so, so close it almost brushed its breast. Brian had only two more arrows and debated moving slowly to change to the spear over his right hand and use that to kill the bird. One more shot, he decided. He would try it again. He slowly brought out another arrow, put it on the string, aimed and released, and this time the flurry of feathers meant that he had made a hit. The bird had been struck off center and was flopping around wildly. Brian jumped on it, grabbed it, slammed it to the ground once sharply to kill it. Then he stood and retrieved his arrows and made sure that they were all right and went down to the lake to wash the blood off his hands. He had kneeled at the water's edge and put the dead bird and his weapons down and dipped his hands into the water. It was very nearly the last act of his life. Later, he would not know why he started to turn. Some smell or sound, a tiny brushing sound, but something caught his ear or nose and he began to turn and had his head half around when he saw a brown wall of fur detach itself from the forest to his rear and come down on him like a runaway truck. He had just time to see that it was a moose. He knew them from pictures, but he did not know, could not guess how large they were when it hit him. It was a cow and she had no horns, but she took him in the left side of the back of the with the back of her forehead, took him and threw him out into the water and came after him to finish the job. He had had another half second to fill his lungs with air and she was on him again, using her head to drive him down into the mud. Insane, he thought. Just, just that, the word insane. Mud filled his eyes, his ears. The horn boss on the moose drove him deeper and deeper into the bottom muck and suddenly it was over. He felt alone. 
He sputtered to the surface, sucking air and fighting panic, and he wiped the mud and water out of his eyes and cleared it, and he saw the cow standing sideways to him, not ten feet away, calmly chewing on a lily pad. She didn't appear to even see him, or didn't seem to care about him, and Brian turned carefully and began to swim and crawl out of the water. As soon as he moved, the hair on her back went up, and she charged him again, using her head and hooves this time, slamming him back down into the water on his back this time, and he screamed the air out of his lungs and hammered on her head with his fist and filled his throat with water once she left again. Once more he came to the surface. He was hurt now, hurt inside hurt in his ribs, and he stayed hunched over, pretended to be dead. She was standing, eating again. Brian, Brian studied her out of one eye, looking at, to the bank with the other, wondering how seriously injured, wondering if she would let him go this time. Insane. He started to move ever so slowly. Her head turned with her hair, went back up like the hair on an angry dog, and he stopped, took a slow breath. The hair went back down, and she ate. Move, hair up, stop. Hair down, move, hair up. Half a foot at a time until he was at the edge of the water. He stayed on his hands and knees indeed. And he was hurt, so he wasn't sure he could walk anyway. And she seemed to accept that and let him crawl slowly out of the water and up into the trees and bushes. When he was behind a tree, he stood carefully and took stock. Legs seemed all right, but his ribs were hurt bad. He could only take short breaths, and then he had a jabbing pain in his right shoulder, and it seemed to be wrenched somehow. Also, his bow and spear and the fool bird were in the water. At least he could walk, and he, hadn't, and he had just about decided to leave everything when the cow moved out of the water, uh, cow moved out of the deeper water and left him quickly as she'd come walking down along the shoreline in the shallow water with her long legs making sucking sounds when she pulled them out of the f pulled them free of the mud hanging on a pine limb he watched her go half expecting her to turn and come back to run over to him but she kept going and when she was well gone from sight he went to the bank and found the bird and waited out a bit to get his bow and spear neither of them were broken and the arrows incredibly were still in his belt pouch though messed up with mud and water. It took him most of an hour to work his way back around the lake. His legs worked well enough, but if he took two or three fast steps, he would begin to breathe deeply, and the pain from his ribs would stop and stop him, and he would have to lean against a tree until he could slow back down to shallow breathing. She had done more damage than he originally thought, the insane cow. No sense to it, no sense at all to it. Just madness. When he got to the shelter, he crawled inside and was grateful that the clothes were still glowing and that he had thought to get firewood first thing in the mornings to be ready for the day. Grateful that he had thought to get enough wood for two or three days at a time. Grateful that he had fish nearby if he needed to eat. Grateful as he dozed off and that he was alive. So insane, he thought, letting sleep cover the pain in his chest. Such an insane attack for no reason and he fell asleep with his mind trying to make the moose have reason. The noise awakened him. It was a low sound, a low roaring that came from the wind. His eyes snapped open, not because it was loud, but because he knew it. He felt wind in his shelter, felt the rain that came with the wind, and heard thunder many times in the past 47 days. But not this, not this noise. Low, almost alive, almost from the throat somehow. The sound... The noise was a roar, a far-off roar, but coming at him. And when he was fully awake, he sat up in the darkness, grimacing with pain from his ribs. The pain was different now, a tightened pain. It seemed less, but the sound, so strange, he thought. A mystery sound, a spirit sound, a bad sound. He took some small wood and got the fire going again, felt some little comfort and cheer from the flames, but also felt that he should get ready. He did not know how, but he should get ready. The sound was coming for him, coming just for him, and they ha had to get ready. The sound wanted him. He found the spear and bow where they were hanging on the pegs on the shelter wall and brought his weapons to the bed and made, he had made of the pine bows. More comfort, but 
like the comfort of the flames, it didn't work with this new threat that he didn't understand yet. Restless threat, he thought, and he stood out of the shelter away from the flames to study the sky, but it was dark. The sound meant something to him, something from his memory, something he had read about, something he had seen on television, something, oh, he thought, oh no! It was wind, wind like the sound of a train, with a low belly roar of a train. It was a tornado. That was it. The roar of a train meant bad wind, and it was coming for him. God, he thought, on top of the moose, not this, not this. But it was too late, too late to do anything. In the strange stillness, he looked to the night sky and then turned back into the shelter and was leaning over to go through the door opening, opening when it hit. Later, he would think of it and find that it was the same as the moose. Just insanity. He was taken in back by some mad force and driven into the shelter on his face, slammed down into the pine branches of his bed. At the same time, the wind tore at the fire and sprayed red coals and sparks in a cloud around him, and then it backed out, seemed to hesitate momentarily, and returned with a massive roar, a roar that took his ears and mind and body. He was whipped against the front wall of the shelter like a rag, felt it a ripping pain, pain in his ribs again, and when he hammered back down onto the sand once more, and the wind took the whole wall, his bed, the fire, his tools, all of it, threw it out into the lake, gone out of sight, gone forever. He felt, felt the fire, he felt the burning on his neck and reached up to find coals there. He brushed those off and found more in his pants, brushed those away, and the wind hit again, heavy gusts, tearing gusts. He heard the trees snapping in the forest around the rock, and he felt his body slipping out and clawed at the rocks to hold himself down. He couldn't think, just held, and knew that he was, knew that he was praying, and didn't know how, what the prayer was, knew that he wanted to be, stay and be, and the wind moved to the lake. Brian heard the great roaring, sucking sounds of water, and has opened his eyes to see the lake torn by the wind, the water slamming in great waves, went all the ways, in all ways, fought each other, and then rose in a spout of water going up into the night sky like a wet column of light. It was, a, it was beautiful and terrible at the same time. The tornado tore one more time at the shore, the opposite side of the lake, and Brian could hear trees being ripped down, and then it was done, gone as rapidly as it had come. It left nothing, nothing but Brian in a pitch dark. He could find nothing of where his fire had been, not a spark, nothing of his shelter, tools, or bed. Even the body of the fool bird was gone. I am back to nothing, he thought, trying to find things in the dark, back to where I was when I crashed, hurt, in the dark, just the same. As if to emphasize his thoughts, the mosquitoes, with the fire gone and protective smoke no longer saving him, came back in thick, nostril-clogging swarms. All that was left was the hatchet at his belt, still there. But now it began to rain, and in the downpour he would never find anything dry enough to get a fire going, and at last he pulled his battered body back under the overhang where his bed had been and wrapped his arms around his ribs. Sleep didn't come, couldn't come, with the insects ripping at him, so he lay the rest of the night slapping mosquitoes, chewing with his mind on the day. This morning he had been fat, well, f well, almost fat, and happy, sure of everything, with good weapons and food and the sun in his face and things looking for a good future. And inside, one day, just one day, he'd been run over by a moose and a tornado, had lost everything and was back to square one. Just like that. A flip of some giant coin and he was the loser. But there was a difference now, he thought. There really is a difference. I might be hit, but I'm not done. When the light comes, I'll start to rebuild. I still have the hatchet. That's all I had in the first place. Come on, he thought, baring his teeth to the darkness. Come on, is that the best you can do? Is that all you can hit me with? A moose and a tornado? Well, he thought, holding his ribs and smiling, then spitting mosquitoes out of his mouth. Well, that won't get the job done. That was the difference now. He had changed, and he was tough. I'm tough where it counts. Tough in the head. In the end, right before the dawn, a kind of cold snap came down. Something else knew, this cold snap, and the mosquitoes settled back into the damp grass under the leaves, and he could sleep, or doze, and at last he thought, 
that the morning had closed his as the morning uh, as he closed his eyes, I hoped the tornado hit the moose. When he awakened, the sun was cooking inside of his mouth and dried it to tongue leather. He had fallen into a deeper sleep with his mouth open just at dawn, and it tasted as if he had been sucking on his foot all night. He rolled out rolled out and almost bellowed with pain from his ribs. They had tightened in the night and seemed to pull at his chest when he moved. He slowed his movements and stood slowly without stretching unduly and went to, to the lake to take a drink. At the shore he kneeled, carefully and with great gentleness, and drank and rinsed his mouth. To his right he saw the fish pond was still there, although the willow gate was gone and there were no fish. They'll come back, he thought, as soon as I can make a spear or bow and get one or two for bait. They'll come back. He turned to look at his shelter and saw that some of the wood for the wall was scattered around the beach, but was still there. And then he saw his bow jammed into a driftwood log, but with the precious strings still intact. Not so bad now, not so bad. He looked at the shoreline and saw the parts of the wall, and, what, and that's when he saw it. Out in the lake, in the short part of the L, something curved and yellow was sticking six or eight inches out of the water. It was a bright color, not an earth or natural color. For a second, he could not place it, and then he knew what it was.